Hello, hello, hello. You should be able to hear me on the stream now. Testing, testing, testing. Be able to hear. Now I was able to hear you just right now. How about, can you hear me right now? Testing, 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 testing. Okay, that's good. I think we, we can go off from here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. All right. See you later. Perfect. Yeah, see you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for everything. No problem. Bye. Since this is going to be a, well, since this is a live stream and it'll be like recorded and whatnot, we're going to get started pretty promptly at 12 just to respect everyone's time because I know this only goes for about 40 minutes. So just letting y'all know at 12 o'clock, we'll get started pretty promptly. Maybe like a minute or two just to give people time to settle in, but definitely going to look to get started um, on time. And thank you, Alex, for, by the way, for confirming that you hear me. Appreciate it. I would have played music in the background or something, but you know, this is a uh, more of a commercial stream. So can't be doing that. I mean, I do have like copyright free music.
we'll be getting started about one minute after the hour. So. Hello, hello. Good evening as well. I know that you're all in various time zones, so thank you all for, for dropping by. All right, I'll give it about one minute and then we'll get started. Oh, nice. Got Egypt. Nice. Yeah, I'm over in the United States. I'm over in New Jersey. Hello, Petrol. Hello, everyone. Hello from Peru. Buenos dias. Okay, 1201. Let's get started. Thank you everyone for chiming in and coming into this stream. Uh, I am watching chat. So if you do have things that are coming up, I will respond to them as necessary. Uh, this is our Terraform question and answer live stream from Arden Labs. So y'all have been giving us questions um, and we have been collecting them and basically putting them on these slides so that I can go over them live with all of you and answer these questions. The format of this is going to be pretty conversational. I'm going to basically be speaking a lot uh, more so than showing code examples. Since we only have 40 minutes and we have about 20 ish questions, I'm going to be more, it's going to be more of a conversational um, style of a presentation rather than like, here's code. Um, so just to dive in, let's, let's get right into it. So I have about 20 ish questions. Let's, let's get into it. So I, or I did order the questions actually in like a, we got a bunch of questions. I ordered them a little bit in a logical order. So, the first question we got was, what is Terraform and what is it used for? So Terraform is is just a CLI tool, right? It's written in Go, um, which is great because all of us should be probably gophers if we're fans of Arden Labs. Uh, and it's a CLI tool written in Go. And what it does is it, it wraps APIs, right? So you might have heard of the phrase, it's infrastructure as code. Yes, but what does that really, what does that really mean? And we'll get into that in the, in the next slide, but... Terraform is just a declarative wrapper around CRUD APIs. What's a CRUD API? Create, read, update, delete. Terraform reaches out to those APIs, makes requests, receives responses, and then saves it to state. So when we say declarative, we say we mean you defined the end state of what you want, and Terraform will work to make that a reality. And we'll cover that a little bit more later because there's other questions more specific um, related to that. What do you use it for? It's used to manage infrastructure via code rather than through the UI. So many of us probably manage infrastructure for our companies or organizations, and often it involves you going into some web interface and clicking around and creating VMs, creating other infrastructure, whatever it may be. Terraform takes all of that and codifies it as a file, as code. So I like to say it turns the clicky clicky into scripty scripty. Right. That's essentially what Terraform is doing here. And 
if you've heard of Terraform um, in the wild, you've probably heard of the phrase infrastructure as code. And that's actually a good segue into the next question, which is what is infrastructure as code? So infrastructure as code is just a fancy way of saying, I'm taking all of your interactions that you've been doing in the UI and I'm codifying it into a file that Terraform knows how to read, parse, and then interpret as actions, right? So if you log into, let's say the AWS uh, console and you go to EC2 and you create yourself a VM, you can, those actions that you've taken, you can take them and codify them as Terraform configuration, right? You can define the actions that you want to do as Terraform configuration and Terraform will say, oh, you just want to create one VM that's T3 micro that's using, you know, this AMI image, et cetera, et cetera. Terraform will read that it's been codified and it'll know how to manage that in the future. What are the benefits of that? Well, now your code is trackable right? Auditable, shareable, you're treating your infrastructure the same way you're treating your actual software for your applications. So that's where we get the moniker infrastructure as code from, right? You're treating the infrastructure as code. I don't generally like the phrase infrastructure as code because Terraform can manage more than just traditional infrastructure. It could manage anything that's fronted by a CRUD API. Uh, the next common question that we've received was how do I create, modify and destroy infrastructure with Terraform? So that's Terraform's bread and butter, right? It's able to create infrastructure, modify infrastructure, destroy infrastructure. Well, the, you use the, what we call the core Terraform workflow in order to manage your infrastructure. And the core Terraform workflow is just three steps, right? It's write, plan and apply. So the right step is to write your configuration, right? You, you literally create a file and you put your, your resource definitions in that file and you tell Terraform exactly what you want and how you want it. Then once you have that configuration syntactically correct and ready to go, you would do what's called a Terraform plan. And in the Terraform plan, Terraform will read your configuration, parse it, and it'll decide what to do and how to create those, those resources. Now, under the hood, Terraform uses what are called plugins to reach out to different APIs, depending on, you know, which API you're interacting with. Maybe it's AWS, maybe it's Azure, maybe it's GCP, maybe it's all three. Uh, but during the plan operation, it'll parse your configuration, reach out to those APIs and say, hey, do we have any infrastructure that matches this? Oh, no, I don't. Great. I have to create it. Oh, hey, do I have any infrastructure that matches this? Yes, I do. Well, is it up to date with what I expect? No, it's not. That's a modification. Hey, do I have any infrastructure out there? Yes, I do, but it's no longer present in my configuration. That's a destroy, right? So Terraform is making those API requests on your behalf and it's working to make reality match what you've defined in your configuration. Okay. And then the apply stage is after the plan, you actually say, yes, I do want to make these changes, right? So we separate the actual plan from the apply here in that you can see what the plan wants to do. And then the apply is saying, yes, go do it. Those are separated out for, for safety and for the ability to review before pushing things to environments. Speaking of providers and APIs and plugins, um, what providers are supported by Terraform? Another common question that comes up. Well, any provider that has a plugin written for it is supported, right? So any CRUD API that has a Terraform provider written for it already is supported in Terraform. And creating a provider plugin is not terribly difficult. There's some guides out there on HashiCorp's Learn um, website in order to, to follow to do that. But the popular providers out there are AWS, Azure, GCP, GitHub, PagerDuty, um, and also there's a Domino's provider to order a Domino's pizza, which is actually really fun. That was like a, I believe it's hackathon project or somebody made that in, in the open source community. So any provider is supported as long as there's a plugin written for it, right? So you have Terraform core, the core CLI binary that you download that, that binary uses different plugins to reach out to these different APIs. So the flow of traffic is really you Terraform core, a Terraform uh, provider plugin, and then the upstream API. That's how the flow of traffic works. 
And I did have a good graphic for this on my training um, content, but I didn't get to put it in the slides, but I do have a good graphic that shows, shows this. So those are the providers that are supported. Another common question is, does Terraform support deploying to multiple providers simultaneously? The answer is a resounding, yes, it does. Uh, and this is a very common pattern, right? Some your, your infrastructure doesn't always live in one provider, right? Maybe you don't, maybe not all of your infrastructure lives in AWS. Maybe you have it split between AWS and Azure or AWS and GCP or what it may be. Or maybe your DNS lives in a, in a completely different place like, you know, Route 53 versus Azure's um, equivalent. You can define multiple providers in a single configuration and tell Terraform to deploy to all of them, right? So you can have an EC2 instance in AWS that's updating DNS using Dyn DNS that's talking to an Azure blob storage bucket in, you know, in Azure. So you can have all of those things working together in one configuration. So we, we tend to say that Terraform is cloud agnostic in that in that regard, right? Because Terraform doesn't care what um, what provider you're talking to, as long as it's defined in the configuration and has authentication to reach out to them. To answer Vanessa's question or Vanessa's question, as long as APIs are there, we can write providers. Exactly. As long as there's a CRUD API upstream somewhere, you can write a provider against that CRUD API to work with Terraform, and that's exactly how they work with the major cloud providers, right? AWS has a public API that you can use. Terraform uses that through its provider plugin. We can cover the difference between modules and providers a little later in the, in the talk. Speaking of modules, uh, how can I reuse and share Terraform configuration across projects? This is a very common question that people have. So generally speaking, Terraform configuration is in a single file or multiple files, depending on how you wanna break it out. Uh, Terraform will read every file in a directory, right? It won't, it won't recurse into directories. It'll just read it at the top level. So if you have multiple files, let's say vm.tf and bucket.tf, uh, et cetera, et cetera, Terraform will read all of those configurations and parse them and treat it as one big root configuration, right? We call it the root module. If you want to create configuration that can be shared across teams and projects, well, you're going you're to have to do a few things first. Generally, you're going to want to use input variables to start dynamically receiving input, right? Because a Terraform configuration that creates a T3 micro EC2 instance every time is kind of not extensible, right? It's kind of useless. You want to start creating input variables to dynamically receive that configuration. So that will basically say like, oh, instead of instead of hard coding things, start exposing them as variables to make that more extensible, more reusable. Think of this as like function parameters, right? Don't just have static variables inside your functions, extract them out as parameters so that your function is a little bit more extensible to more use cases. Same thing with Terraform. Once you have that, you wanna think about what your Terraform configuration should export to others. You can do that using outputs, so once, once Terraform creates a VM or whatever infrastructure that you're, you're using, you can have it output information about the infrastructure that other people can now use. This is how you can start tying pipelines together. And the best way to reuse and share a configuration in Terraform is to create what we call a module. Now Terraform has this concept of the root module and child modules. The root module is just the directory that you're executing Terraform from. Child modules are similar to like functions in programming languages. They're defined pieces of Terraform configuration that you can call again and again and again in different scenarios. You pass it different variables to call it different ways. Modules can contain resources, data sources, inputs, outputs, etc. So basically, a module is just an abstraction of Terraform configuration that you've defined, right? And it's up to you as the engineer to go find your logical abstractions and make the modules for that, right? You might have, you might find an abstraction for your entire apps. So you make this giant module, or you might say, you know what, I'm going to chop it up a little bit and make a module just for networking, a module just for buckets, a module just for this. That's fine. As long as you, the engineer has found your abstractions, you can create modules to provide those abstractions to others. 
Uh, and then the key thing here is version your modules, right? You always, you should treat your modules like software and you should version them. That way you don't ship breaking changes to different callers, right? So that's what modules are. And I should have clicked the next slide of what modules are, but uh, I'll just go over it briefly again. A module is just a way to create an abstraction of Terraform configuration. Uh, and it's similar to a function in programming. So that's, that's the benefit of Terraform modules. You can find a bunch of Terraform modules available to the, the general public on Terraform's registry. Uh, there's like a VPC module for AWS, EC2 instance ones, all of these things. They're already out there. People have already created their abstractions and they expose it for the world to use. Cool. Another common question is how can I manage multiple environments uh, with Terraform? And you know, you might have multiple environments in your setup. You might have production, staging, development, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How can you manage these environments with Terraform? Well, there's multiple ways to do this, uh, but generally I've found the best practices here to be create reusable modules that are called with different variables or different inputs for each environment. For example, you might have a module for your Foo app, right? That module is abstracted, it's reusable, and you call it with certain variables for your production environment, and you call it with different variables for your staging environment. You're using the same code, but they're, it's called in different ways to do different things. That means that your production and staging environments can be closer to each other in how, they're, in how they are deployed, and there's less drift, right? When you do this though, you're gonna to wanna to version your stuff, right? Version your modules, version your providers, cause you don't wanna introduce breaking changes and you don't wanna deploy something in staging that breaks, but then since your modules were never versioned, production also gets those deploys, right? And it breaks too. So definitely version your modules when you do that. And generally I've found that one Terraform state file per environment is generally the best way to go about this because you don't want to mix and, and match production, staging, and dev all in the Terraform, or all, all in the Terraform, or sorry, all in the same Terraform state file. You're gonna want to break those up into different state files for a few reasons, which we'll cover when I have answer some more questions about state and how that works. How do you do versioning? When you create a module, you'll have to host it somewhere, perhaps maybe on GitHub or GitLab or wherever you host your own version controls and you would version it using native VCS tagging methods, right? Branches, tags, whatever it may be. That's how you would version it. You cannot version a module that's on your local file system unless you do some crazy setup with symbolic links and all this other crap. Don't do that, please, just don't do that. Come on, really. <laughs> but yeah, you would generally version it by storing it on a version control system or the Terraform registry if it's a public module. Cool. So what is the best way to organize your Terraform configuration? Now, this is a more subjective question, uh, but I'm going to answer it just by giving you information that you can use. So the best way to organize Terraform configuration changes depending on who you ask, and it changes depending on what your goals are, right? So I've generally found in my career that it's better to use multiple smaller configurations instead of like single large configurations. What I mean by that is it's better to find those logical separations where your app can be broken up or your infrastructure can be broken up and create a single Terraform configuration for each of those. Why? Because when you have these large configurations, Terraform has to now manage all of that infrastructure. And sometimes not all the infrastructure changes every time. So you get yourself in a situation where Terraform has to reach out and make all these API requests that it doesn't really need because that infrastructure is not changing. So I found that multiple smaller configurations are better than like a single larger configurations. Uh, and generally what you want to do is you want to split your configurations across different concerns. A, a good pattern that I've seen in use in the wild is using like a configuration for base infrastructure, right? Like your base VPCs and your base networking, your base IAM roles, all that stuff that you build upon, and then having a separate configuration for your application specific um, infrastructure. That way, the application specific infrastructure can use that base infrastructure as a starting point, right? It can say, oh, give me the public VPC 
rather than the app infrastructure being responsible for creating a, a new VPC, right? You can use existing stuff. Uh, I, I feel like that's a, a good way to do it. I've seen that in the wild to, to great success uh, and scaled up pretty high. And then another way to split up your, your configurations is think about what frequently changes versus what does not frequently change. What I mean by that is your application is generally constantly changing, right? You're, you're coding, you're deploying, things are updating, things are changing but there's other infrastructure that doesn't really change often, right? Like you create an S3 bucket probably one time and then you never touch it again, you know, or you create like a, um, a security group rule or an IAM policy or whatever it may be. You create it like one time and you probably never touch it again or subnet. That subnet's a great uh, example. If you see a pattern where you have frequently changing infrastructure and infrequently changing infrastructure, that's a good uh, point to ask yourself. I should probably split this up. Or can I split this up? That's a good indication of that. Uh, and then generally you would want to have one configuration or root module per application per environment, right? So if you have the foo application, you would have one root module for foo production, foo staging, foo de development, logically separating them across applications and environments is useful for when things go wrong. So you're not blocked, right? Um, you can manage all of them in one in one file if you want, but congratulations, dev's broken. You can't deploy to prod, right? And without fixing your Terraform state. Uh, and last thing I've seen about organization organiz eh, about organizing Terraform code, I can't even speak, is to favor being explicit over being dry until you find your abstractions. So I see a lot of people out there, they use these big variables to do very complex things in Terraform. And then they need to make one little change and they can't because they've coded themselves into a dead end. And now you have to unravel what's even happening with these large variables. Be explicit at first. It's far easier to go from being explicit to being dry than it is to go from being dry to being explicit. So be explicit at first. It's okay to do some copying, right? Copy this resource to that resource. It's okay to do that copying up front until you find where your abstractions are and then you make a proper abstraction using a module or something, right? That's my, like, that's what I would say, my advice for this. So we talked a little bit about Terraform state, uh, but what is Terraform state? So when you apply Terraform configuration, it actually makes the resources in, you know, real infrastructure, right? It really reaches out to AWS and creates you your EC2 instance. However, there's going to be some information that Terraform does not know of until it creates the resource, like the resources identifier, right? That information is not stored in your configuration. It's stored in Terraform state file. So Terraform state file is just information that Terraform keeps about the resources that it's managing. It needs this information for about a couple of reasons. One, it helps map your configuration file to reality. If you define a, a EC2 instance in your configuration that's using T3 micro size and like AMI one, two, three, and you have two of them, how does Terraform know which one is which in AWS? Cause it's going to see two AWS EC2 instances that match that criteria. How does it know which one's which? Well, it uses the ID, but you never defined an ID in the configuration. That's what states for. It stores the ID in the state file so that the next time Terraform runs, it can say, oh, yeah, yeah, that first configuration, that's mapping to ID one, that second one's mapping to ID two, gotcha, no problem. So that's the primary purpose for Terraform state. Then tertiary um, purposes are for other metadata about Terraform, such as like outputs, inputs, et cetera, for performance reasons, because instead of having to reach out to that upstream API to refresh what you know about the resources, you can just look in your state file. And then for syncing, if I make changes, they're saved in the state. And then if you make changes using the same state file, you'll see my changes as well. And we won't like, you know, tr uh, topple over each other. So that's the primary use case and what state is. States are stored in what we call backend. So what is a Terraform backend and what is it used for? That is the question here. Uh, a Terraform backend is just a location where state files are stored, right? There's one state file per one root configuration uh, for Terraform. And the default backend is just a local file on disk. If you go and run Terraform apply, you will see a terraform.tf state file in your directory after you're done. 
uh, and that's the default location for state. However, having a local state file is not very beneficial when you're working in many teams. So there's something called a remote backend, which stores your state file remotely on some HTTP endpoint, in a database, in S3, wherever it may be. Those give you additional features like being able to share your state between teams, right? You would do this when you wanna use CICD so that everyone's operating against the same state and doesn't trip over one another and things like that. Uh, the remote backends also provide what we call locking. As in, if I were executing a Terraform apply right now and you tried to execute a Terraform apply at the same time, I would have locked the state file. I have the lock. You can't do anything until I release the lock to prevent these collisions. So different backends provide those different features. Uh, you would want to choose the backend that's correct for your use case. Generally speaking, you would want to use a remote backend when you're working in a team. This is a great question. How can I test and validate Terraform configuration? So I'm probably not the best person to answer how can I test Terraform configuration because I'm not a big believer in testing. I'm not a big believer in asserting your infrastructure was created correctly, right? Terraform is already tested. The provider plugins are already tested. I'm not going to write extra tests to know that my EC2 instance came out as a T3 micro. I don't care, right? Like that's not something I should be asserting on. I should be trusting the lower level abstractions that they've already tested that, right? You don't trust that your programming language, like, like a one plus one is a two, right? I mean, you do for your app, but not for the low level stuff. So when I, when I hear say people saying, I want to test my configuration, I generally say, well, then deploy your application on it and do integration tests on your app. Like that's what you should be doing, right? You care as an engineer, you're going to care about your app, not so much the infrastructure. Now there's people that out there like, no, no, I have to assert my infrastructure. I just a requirement. That's fine. You can do that. There are tools out there for you that, that can help you do that. There's like Terra tests, Terraform kitchen, um, some other things. Terraform itself is now introducing a test command for modules. It's experimental support right now because it's a, a new experimental feature that they're trying to see like how it's going to work, but that's out there too. So those are the ways you can do like testing, but in terms of like validation, generally speaking, what you would do is you would run like Terraform format to syntactically check whether your code is, is, um, like formatted correctly. So that's one thing of how you validate. You would do a Terraform init to try to download your provider plugins and seeing if Terraform can actually communicate to download those plugins. You would do what's called a Terraform validate to syntactically validate your configuration. Now, not just formatting, but whether like you're not using correct variables somewhere, whatnot, right? Valid Terraform configuration. And then you would do plans and you would see like, am I drifting? I created a T3 micro instance. If I plan again, there should be no changes. So that's a good way to do a test, right? Create your infrastructure, run another plan. There should be no changes. If there is, something's wrong. Uh, and there's also things built into the language like preconditions and post conditions, where you can define a precondition or post condition on a file, or sorry, on a configuration, and then basically test like, oh, does this meet the configuration? For example, if you wanted to enforce that everyone has to have a certain tag, you can do a precondition or a post condition to make sure that the tags follow some format. So good ways to test and validate those configs. What are some common pitfalls when using Terraform? Well, there's something called the refresh slowness, where if you have so many resources in a configuration, all of those resources have to be refreshed before Terraform could plan. That involves reaching out to the API, seeing what the, the current resource is in real infrastructure and reporting it back to Terraform. If you have so many resources in a configuration file, that can take a long time. I'm talking hundreds or hundreds or thousands of resources. You're making hundreds or hundreds of thousands of API requests now that can slow your Terraform plan down. And I, also, I often see people like, Hey, I have like a thousand resources under manage. Why is my plan taking so long? Because you're making a thousand something API requests now. So think about that. Uh, when you're using Terraform, there's ways to get around that, which my course goes over. Uh, and then there's things like configuration drift where people are manually modifying your infrastructure out of band and, you know, changing things up. Uh, in the interest of time, I do want to go to the next question. What are some of the best practices when using Terraform? Generally, we've already covered some of these. Use separate states for separate concerns, right? Separate state files for separate environments. Use outputs to connect one Terraform configuration to another. And then version everything. Version the CLI binary you're using. Version the provider binaries you're using. Version the modules you're using. 
Don't allow unintended changes to come in and screw up your production deploys. Version everything. How can I integrate Terraform into my CI/CD workflow? This one is an interesting one because Terraform is just a CLI binary. So as long as you have your configuration and your state file, you can run Terraform wherever you want, right? But generally speaking, the workflow is to run plans on your pull requests. So you can see like what's changing and get that, that feedback. Run applies once those merge to main or merge to your default branch. You can use a, a different CI/CD runner that allows you to rerun Terraform without a new, a new pull request. So a common thing that I see people struggle with is, Hey, I already merged the main, but the plan or sorry, but the apply failed. What do I do? I don't want to make another pull request. Cause that's a, I have to go through all these hoops. You should be using a runner that allows you to re-execute the runs, right? Instead of going through the whole pull request merge process again. And the biggest thing here is use what we call a plan file. Terraform has this concept. When you run Terraform plan, it can output the result of that plan to a binary file known as a plan file. That is exactly what Terraform wants to do. You would use that as an artifact in CI CD, pass that to the apply, and then the apply will apply directly from that plan file without reaching back out to the public APIs. Why is this beneficial? Because at the time of plan, you could have uh, had a data source that read the current AMI for your application as AMI one, two, three. But if you did not use a plan file, when you, by the time the apply operation happened, let's say that happened the next day. Well, then a new AMI would, would have been published, maybe AMI four, five, six. And now when the apply happens, you're going to get AMI four, five, six, rather than AMI one, two, three, which is the one you approved on the pull request. So use a plan file to, to make sure that the ones, the plans that you have approved are the actual actions that are going to be applied. Again, these are more things that we go over in the course for Terraform. How does Terraform manage dependencies between resources? Very good question. One that I think a lot of people struggle with. Terraform has a concept of implicit dependencies and explicit dependencies. So implicit dependencies are things that Terraform can infer just by reading your configuration. For example, if I create an AWS key pair for SSH, and then I use that key pair in the EC2 instance, that's an implicit dependency between those two resources in that the SSH key must be created before the EC2 instance, because the EC2 instance uses the SSH key. That's an implicit dependency. Explicit dependencies are you in the configuration explicitly saying this resource depends on that resource. Generally, you shouldn't really use explicit dependencies, but there are times where Terraform cannot infer a dependency relationship and you should use, you know, explicit dependencies. How does Terraform even know how to do these dependencies managements? It uses what's called a directed acyclic graph or a DAG. And it basically walks your configuration, drawing a graph in code, and then says like, oh, this resource depends on this, this depends on that. And it draws a big graph. And that's how Terraform knows which resources to apply first and then which resources to, to destroy first, right? So it's like a stack, right? To apply these and then to destroy these. So that's how Terraform manages um, dependencies. Can Terraform be used for on-premise infrastructure? Absolutely. So this is just a, a resounding yes. You can use Terraform for more than just cloud infrastructure, even though like when you search Terraform, all you see is cloud infrastructure things, but there's many more providers than just AWS, GCP, and Azure. There's providers for VMware, for Proxmox, for OpenStack, for Nomad, for Kubernetes, for Docker. You can build your own provider if you have a CRUD API to, to code against. So yes, you can use Terraform to manage your on-premise infrastructure as well. And many people do. There's a lot of people out there that use VMware and there's a lot of home labbers that use Proxmox and they use Terraform to manage that too. So yes, Terraform can be used for on-premise infrastructure. Can Terraform manage existing infrastructure? Absolutely. If you have an EC2 instance or a virtual, a virtual machine in VMware, you can tell Terraform to start managing that infrastructure by doing a process called importing. Importing is when you tell Terraform, Hey, I have, I have EC2 instance ID one, two, three, four, five, go pull that and map it back to my configuration here. Terraform will do that and it'll map the configuration back. And now it's starting to be managed under Terraform. You get into some interesting things here where importing right now, there's no way to bulk import. You do have to go resource by resource, 
but I kind of view that as a good thing because it makes you think about what it is you're doing and how you're laying things out. But yes, Terraform can manage existing infrastructure. Can Terraform replace a specific resource without modifying other resources? Absolutely. So Terraform has a few ways to do this. There's like a replace flag that you can pass and you can pass it a specific resource identifier and you can say, hey, replace this. You can taint it, which was the old way of doing it. But Terraform supports being able to change only what needs to be changed because Terraform is declarative. You are defining the end state of your infrastructure and Terraform is working hard to make sure that your infrastructure matches that end state. So you, you declarative just means you define the end state. In that, Terraform is also, I say idempotent, but people say idempotent. But either way, Terraform is idempotent in that it will only make changes that need to be changed, right? If you run the same Terraform apply over and over again, you should get no changes because it's idempotent, right? Idempotent, however you want to say it. Uh, so that's some of the benefits of Terraform versus something like Ansible or Chef or Puppet, right? They're more imperative. Uh, Terraform is declarative. Does Terraform support auto-completion? Yes, it does. There is a Terraform LS uh, program to provide like a language server, uh, and there's extensions for VS Code, Vim, etc. So you can use auto-complete in Terraform. I'm a Vim user, uh, NeoVim, whatever, uh, but I use this Terraform LS to provide me auto-completion and such. And there's a beautiful VS Code plugin that's maintained by people at HashiCorp. Uh, you could use that as well. So it does support auto completion. It's actually pretty, pretty nice to use. VS code gets a, a lot more features than Vim because just the plugin ecosystem of how it works. But yes, they're out there. Go search Terraform LS if you want to use that. And then the last question that we've had was what are the most useful Terraform commands? So there's Terraform format to format your configuration, right? Which is something you would probably run in CICD as a linting step. There's Terraform init that actually reaches out and initialize Terraform. There's Terraform plan and Terraform apply. Those are like the main ones. Outside of those though, I find the most useful commands that I use is validate. Uh, Cause not a lot of people actually use validate. You'd be surprised. Terraform console, which drops you into like a little sub shell that allows you to run Terraform interpolations and Terraform functions because there are different interpolations and functions built into Terraform itself. And you can use Terraform console to execute them and run them and see what's what's happening. Outside of that, there's Terraform graph, which will draw you your graph of how your resources map to one another and show you all the dependencies. You can output that as a, I believe a DOT file and view it with something like graph viz. And you can see your entire graph of infrastructure, which is fantastic. Uh, and then the other two most important commands for me is like Terraform state and Terraform import things to manage state files. I often have to manage a lot of state file things when things go wrong and I have to fix it. So state and import are some of the most useful commands to me. When you're talking about state files and why you need them, can you talk more about the IDs you mentioned? Not sure I follow what you're saying. Yes, I'll give it a quick answer to that. When you create an EC2 instance in AWS and you say, hey, I want you to create an instance with AMI one, two, three, and it's going to be a size T3 micro. When you create that instance, Amazon will generate a, an ID for it, right? It'll say ID dash ABCD. It'll give it a randomly generated identifier once it's created. Terraform will not know that identifier unless the resource is created. So after it creates the resource, it stores that identifier inside Terraform state so that the next time you go to plan or apply, it knows that that identifier maps back to that specific configuration in your code. How about Terraform Cloud? So Terraform Cloud is a great platform. I actually um, work on the Terraform Enterprise team at HashiCorp, which is the on-premise version of Terraform Cloud. Uh, it's very useful to integrate into CI/CD process because it supports things like webhooks, role-based access control, and such. I like using something like Terraform Cloud for my CI/CD process because it decouples the CI CD run from the Terraform execution. And that's like one of my biggest things about it is even if my CI CD run were to fail or something, or if my Terraform were to fail applying, I can just go into Terraform cloud and re-execute that run for that commit rather than having to go through this whole pull request process or re-execute the CI CD run or blah, blah, blah. 
because let's be face it, a lot of people's CI/CD pipelines, they're not item potent, right? That you can't rerun them without doing changes again. It's like a lot of people are pretty bad at that, right? So decoupling that is very useful to me. And Terraform Cloud provides additional features like, you know, policy checks, cost estimation, etc. Cool. I know we have about two minutes left. So last two things, we, uh, we are holding a ultimate Terraform open enrollment course, free four day online training from April 24th to 27th, uh, where I will be teaching the ultimate Terraform class to learn more about Terraform, more code, more hands-on examples, more in depth, right? This was just a, a brief question answer stream to go over the high level, but I'll be hosting this course on April 24th to the 27th. Will we use all four days? I'm not sure yet. Uh, this is kind of a feeler for the pacing of the course and to get the content finalized. So come through, hang out, and we can all go through Terraform together. And with that being said, we're on the last slide. I really like to keep time. So we have a, a bundle, right? Like a raffle. So we've entered everyone's names that are attending or that have signed up for the stream into a spinning wheel. So you need to be present. So I'm going to spin the wheel. And if your name is called and you're here, comment back. If you don't comment within 10 seconds or 15 seconds, then I will have to go to the next one and spin again. Uh, you are eligible to win a Go course bundle from Arden Labs. And also, if you're looking for discounts on any Arden Labs things, we have an egg hunt game that you can find on Arden Labs Twitter. Awesome. So with that, I am going to go to the spinner and spin. And these are all the people that have actually signed up to attend the event. Oh, I hate the audio. Okay. I, I hate the audio, but I'm sorry. So Mohammed Nasser, you are the winner here. If you are here, please uh, comment in this chat. And that way I can get you your stuff. I'll give you a couple seconds to reply just to see if you are attending because part of the thing is that you have to attend this live session. So I will give about 10 seconds. Yeah, like Vegas for real. That was kind of like Vegas. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, I am gonna have to move on to the next person. I'm gonna spin and I, I don't know if I can turn off the sound here. Yeah, I don't think I can. <laughs> oh, it's so cheesy. I love it. Alexandru, Bad Dragon, are you here? If you are, please reply in the chat so that you can be the recipient of the bundle giveaway. And I will also give 10 seconds for this. Feel with the sound. I know the sound is so funny. I could probably mute this tab though. And thank you all for the, the, the great presentation. The to answer your question, Akil, the prerequisites for the course are nothing. You just have to have some familiarity with using like a command line interface. That's the only prerequisite. Okay, Alexander, you are not here. You have not reached out, so I will go to the next person. It has to be a way to turn the sound off. <laughs> ah, there we go. I'll mute the tab. Okay, Nikhil. Nikhil BS, are you here? If you are, then you are the recipient of this bundle. So if you are here, please I'll respond in the chat. If not, I'll have to move on to the next one. Always bet on black, exactly. Always, always black. <laughs> never red, never red. Hello, okay, Nikhil is here, so you are the winner. I see you here. Sweet. I was just gonna post it in chat as well. Perfect, awesome. And that's all I had for you all. So thank you so much for, for coming by. I really appreciate it. I'll just keep this up for, for now while I, I close. But yeah, I appreciate you all hanging out here and learning more about Terraform. Again, we do have that course coming up. 
uh, the Ultimate Terraform course, April 24th to April 27th. It's free. You just have to have some experience with going on, you know, with working with a command line interface. We're going to dive into Terraform. Uh, the course content's all available on GitHub. I still have to publish the, the second half of it, but I'm getting there. Um, and bring your questions, bring your, you know, your curiosity. We'll go over Terraform there. Again, thank you all for, for coming through. And as we said before, there is an egg hunt game that you can find out from Arden Labs Twitter to find out how you can get discounts for my course and other courses at Arden Labs. But appreciate it all. Thank you all for happening, for coming by and coming through and asking questions. If you have any other questions that you couldn't ask this time or that you think of after this, reach out to us on Twitter, right? Arden Labs uh, is on, on Twitter and I'm on Twitter as well at Pseudo Mateo. So come by, ask questions. We would be happy to answer questions for you about Terraform, Go, Rust, whatever it may be, right? How to enroll in the course. You can go enroll in the course. I will drop the link actually real quick because that is a good question. I wish I had the uh, the live the the link directly, but here I will log it right here. So that is the link for the course, uh, and I'll just I'm gonna spam it just a little bit real quick just so you all see it, and then you can sign up there and enroll there. So thank you for that. I should have put the link on the slide, but you know I forgot. I'm not gonna lie, but cool. I'll see you all later. Thank you for for stopping by, and 